We will now talk about cell-to-cell -cell communication and development. Development is more than just differentiation. We've talked quite a bit about differentiation and we will certainly talk a lot more about it. But we also have to understand that a cell can differentiate, but it has to get to the place where it needs to form that new tissue or that new organ. So how do these separate tissues form from populations of cells? How do the cells get where they need to go to become a finger bone and not a pelvic bone? Or how, how do we get a heart, heart tissue up in our left thorax and the lung in the left thorax also will leave a notch for that heart to be positioned in the correct place? How do we happen to have a retina in, our, in the back of our eye and the corneum in the front of our eye? Well, there are things that allow our body in the beginning of the embryonic stages to start moving around in such a way that these cells and tissues get to the right place at the right time. And you may recall uh, when we talked about gastrulation, about how the cells, the sheets of cells, would involute and form from the epidermis. Uh, you would get an involution form mesoderm. You would get endoderm forming. And you may recall the yolk plate formed by endoderm cells becoming involuted into the inside of the embryo. Well, this is the early stages of reorganization of cells and tissues and movements in such a way that we allow normal developmental processes to take place and our body forms into our body the way it should be. One of the th mechanisms to do that is a phenomenon called differential cell affinity. Cell membranes differ among different cell types, and some of the early work was done by an individual by the name of Holtfreiter. He did some work with Towns, uh, but Johannes Holtfreiter had a laboratory where he studied the reaggregation of cells, and th that's illustrated here. And what he found was something very, very interesting. He found that if you took, uh, here are two embryos now, these are amphibian embryos, frog embryos, and if he took presumptive epidermal cells from an embryo that was albino, and he took the neural plate cells from an embryo that was pigmented, dissociated these cells, and then he could have them re-aggregate in such a way that they formed a ball, then they segregated further so that the non-colored cells, the albino cells were on the outside, in other words the epidermal cells formed on the outside just like they were doing in the embryo, and the neural tissue cells formed in the center of the embryo. As far as the mechanism for doing this, the technique of doing this, Holtfreiter uh, and his colleagues had learned that you could dissociate cells by having an alkaline pH. You raise the pH, the cells will dissociate. You can then mix them together, bring the pH back to normal range of about seven, and then they will re-aggregate again, and this is the phenomenon he's observed. Again, that initially, although the cells were randomly arranged, as progression of this differentiation took place in this small embryoid, didn't really form an embryo, but you could see that in further studies, Holtfreiter found that he could mix various combinations of embryonic amphibian cells, and you would get various kinds of segregations of these cells based on what they would do in the uh, embryo's body. Even though they weren't really forming an embryo, they were forming embryoids or partial embryos. So let's look at some of the experiments that he did. Here, when he mi uh, mixed epidermis and mesoderm, you might guess what happened. The blue is the epidermal material. The red is the mesodermal material. And you can see that initially it, these cells are randomly arranged. And then the mesoderm organizes in the center, forming some actually mesodermal type structures. And the epidermis forms on the outside. And that's certainly what you would expect to see in a developing embryo. If you mixed mesoderm and endoderm, a similar kind of result. Now this might be a little surprising in the sense that you're seeing the endoderm form on the outside and the mesoderm again on the inside. You might think, well, the endoderm is in the inner part of the embryo. However, keep in mind 
that the endoderm covers the inside. It's a covering type of epithelial layer. So although it's not epidermis, it's endoderm, it is still epithelium and it will form a covering on the inside of the body. So this cover also covers then the mesoderm and what you can see then is that endodermal material, the endodermal cells, will cover the mesoderm, similar to the way epidermis covers it. If we take epidermis, mesoderm, and endoderm, a very interesting observation here. What happens is that as the embryoid develops, you will get the epidermis on the outside, the mesoderm deep to the epidermis, but the endoderm now doesn't really interact very much with the epidermis except at this juncture, but the endoderm also covers that mesoderm. So the conclusion that Holtfreuder and colleagues made, and, and let me just finish this, uh, you get the epidermis down here covering a mesodermal layer, and here the endoderm actually associates with the mesoderm too, and in a sense covers that mesodermal area. What the conclusion is, and this has been verified in further experiments, is that there's a differential kind of and selective affinity. In some, the epidermis will react with mesoderm in a positive way. However, it is a negative interaction with endoderm. So epidermis and endoderm don't interact with each other. Mesoderm interacts positively with both epidermis and endoderm, so mesoderm will seek out and associate with both epidermis and endoderm. That's why you get this relationship of the mesoderm being associated with both the endoderm and, in a sense, sandwiched between mesoderm, uh, between epidermis and endoderm, but the endoderm really does not become associated with the epidermis. Let's look now at neural plate and epidermis. Again, uh, as expected, uh, the neural plate material will form on the inside. The epidermis will be on the outside because, again, of the sorting out and reconstruction of spatial relationships that really form in the embryonic amphibian. When neural plate and axial mesoderm and epidermis are mixed together, you can see that the cells are initially randomly arranged, then the epidermis forms in the outside, the mesoderm in the middle, and the neural plate material on the inside. And that's really what happens in the embryo. You recall that the neural plate material will form below the forming invagination of the neural area, the ectoderm, and this forms then the neural tube. So Holtfreiter's conclusions from this were that Cells have different cell membrane components. They have a selective affinity among different cell types, and these selective affinities may change, though, as development progresses. As you take older tissues, you do not see the same kind of relationship that you do in these early embryonic amphibian cells. If we look at the seven-day chick neural retina, which is illustrated here, we can see that there are some unpigmented cells that are light colored and pigmented cells. Initially, they're aggregated together, but as development progresses now, you will see that the unpigmented cells, which are the neural retina cells, as opposed to the uh, pigmented retinal cells, form and coalesce together, and you get the unpigmented neural retina cells on the outside and the pigmented retina cells on the inside. So this then led to another model of an individual by the name of Malcolm Steinberg from Princeton University, and this was a thermodynamic model of cell interactions. And what uh, Professor Steinberg suggested was that there was a differential adhesion hypothesis, certainly, and that explained the cellular interactions on the basis of a thermodynamics of how the energy was placed among these cells. Certain cell types migrate centrally when combined with other cell types and peripherally when combined with a different type of cell type. So the cells arrange themselves into the most thermodynamically stable pattern. Embryos during development will have cell movements based on changes then in cell surface. In further studies, Professor Steinberg and his colleagues 
found that there was a hierarchy in sorting. Here you can see that he would dissociate cells and then mix them with other cells and found that depending on the surface tension available, these cells would either be on the inside or the outside. The higher the surface tension, the more the cells would stick together and the more that they would aggregate forming a tighter bound group of cells and not allowing the other cells to come in. So the limb bud was green, very tightly bound cells, high surface tension. The pigmented epithelial cells were red in this case. And then, however, if you mix these pigmented epithelial cells with heart cells, the pigmented epithelial cells now were on the inside.